Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the sixth presentation of our response series at Social Venture Partners Dallas. Social Venture Partners Dallas is an organization of engaged men and women who come to us with their time, their talents, and their financial resources to help support the work of organizations, social enterprises in our local community to grow the capacity, to grow their business side so that they can reach more people, so that they can scale, and so that they can implement their missions more effectively. We are very proud to say that many of the organizations that are serving on the front lines in here in our local community have been supported and strengthened by the partners at Social Venture Partners over these many years. Our session today was originally intended to be a session around the disparities, what COVID-19 has shed a light on in terms of the African-American communities and how they are suffering ill effects at a great, much larger percentage than white communities are as a result of the pandemic. With the recent incident, it is um, really a time when we have all had to sit back and reevaluate everything. The murder of George Floyd by a police officer has set us back dramatically in many ways, but yet has propelled us forward. And so we are having a much larger conversation today around the issues of race and systemic racism and how that affects everything uh, that we are experiencing in our world today. Social Venture Partners takes a pretty unique view of these things. And over the last several years, we have uh, advanced a theory of change. Whereas most nonprofits and most philanthropic organizations believe that poverty is the underlying reason for our social ills, Social Venture Partners believes that there is an even deeper reason. And that is the issue of racism and gender inequality. That is what causes poverty and that is what needs to be treated. And so when we talk about systemic change, we look to work with the organizations who are working in those areas. We invite your support in our work. We are a nonprofit ourselves and we certainly invite you to support our work with your time, your talent and your financial resources. You know, over 50 years ago when I was in second grade, Sister Olivia brought, came into the classroom and told us all to take out our workbooks, our religion workbooks. And she told us to turn to a particular page and those pages were covered with the photos, the drawings of many, many children in many, many shades of all of the possible races that there are in the world. And she told us to take a look at those faces. And she said to us, when you see those faces, you're looking at the face of God. So no matter what color a person's face is, they are a reflection of God. Now the nuns were feared and revered. And if Sister Olivia said that that was the case, that was the case. And I believed it then, and I still believe it today. What no one taught me though for many, many years is this whole notion of systemic racism, how powerful it is, how hard it is to combat, and how much work it takes to make change. I am thrilled to have Dr. Heather Hackman with us today, who is an expert in this area. I am thrilled to have Ms. Kimberly O'Neill with us today, who is on our board of directors at Social Venture Partners, a social justice advocate and a local educator here in the Metroplex. And of course, Dr. Michael Sorrell, who is the president of Paul Quinn College. I have learned so much over the years from each of these panelists. I continue to be inspired by each of them and I continue to learn from them. And so I'm going to turn to Dr. Heather Hackman right now to speak a bit about a framework. I know that, you know, I have been in, in your workshops and I know that th these things take days and hours to really delve into and do well. I'm giving you a few minutes to give us a framework for th these, these conversations. So I turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Hackman. Thanks, Tony. Um, and thank you all for being here. It's awesome to see folks and it's an honor and a privilege to be on this panel. Um, I'm coming to you from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, 
where a lot has happened, a lot has been happening. Um, tragic, horrifying things have happened and uh, quite remarkable things have happened. And so I think that's always the case when we talk about um, social change uh, regarding longstanding, often thought to be intractable systems is that uh, it is quite intense and often quite difficult and challenging. And so it's an honor and a privilege to be with you all here today. And I think uh, the question that you shared with me earlier, Tony, was that kind of setting a framework for understanding systemic racism um, and how that operates. And let me just say um, that the information I want to quickly share is not mine. Uh, so let me be really clear about that. There have been four centuries of Native people and people of color um, articulating a concise and clear understanding of what um, dynamics of racial oppression look like, how they operate, how to change them in this country. And so I'm sitting in front of a, a, a number of books, not to make myself look smart, um, but just to center as best as possible um, the language and the voices and the framing that uh, BIPOC folks have put forward for a very, very, very long time. Um, so what I'll share is not mine. Um, it's just an articulation of critical race theory um, and, um, and so much of the work that Native folks and folks of color have done to try to educate our entire society about this. So having said that, one of the most common misunderstandings of racism is that it's one person to another person. And I think that understanding or thinking about racism just on this individual or interpersonal level is what allows um, the notion of what happened here in Minneapolis to be just one or two or three or four bad apples um, and, and belies the fact that there's a huge system in operation. So what we tell folks, we always do a pre-assessment when we go into organizations and train them. We ask them a definition of racism. Quite commonly, that definition is when one person treats another person badly because of the color of their skin. And that's, that's the symptom, but that's not the issue. And so what we ask people to do is cast your gaze up and start to understand or continue to understand dynamics of racism in the United States as this coupling of large systems and structures that have happened and can, over a long period of time. So systems and history, and they continue to happen today. And so that's why some folks are saying those officers are just bad apples. And a whole host of other people are saying, no, 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 this is actually about the system, systems and structures. And very much like weather, systems and structures have a huge impact on the daily lives of people on the ground. So it's not that the individual and interpersonal levels are irrelevant. It's just that that's not the place where you're gonna affect extraordinary change. You actually have to move up to the systems in order to have the most change um, th that is substantial and lasting. And very much like Congressman, Congressman Allred was referencing Brian Stevenson, um, to simply say racism is just that that individual interpersonal level is a misdiagnosis. And if that's the prevailing belief in the United States writ large around what racism is, it's no wonder that the United States writ large has not responded well to this. And so if we understand that racism is about a system, structures, institutions, interpersonal and individual, if we see it in its biggest form and the way that it affects life on the ground, then we can start to say, oh, wow. If we look at the system of policing in this country historically over time, then we can bring ourselves to the moment of the murder of Mr. Floyd and understand it much more clearly. Not only can we diagnose it accurately to continue that example, but we also can develop a, a treatment protocol, if you will, that is gonna be most effective. Um, rather than small little moves here and there, we can actually construct an approach to systemic and structural racism that is to scale to the problem. And so what you've got is this system that's pressing down institutions, structures in our society, pressing down on communities of color and native communities, not out of some kind of racial animus, but because of resources. And that's where, um, let me see if I can find where the book is on this stuff. That's where the color of law is an incredibly helpful reference because Richard Rothstein outlines quite clearly the role of redlining. And redlining has continues to happen for over a century in the United States, not just because white people and native people and communities of color can't get along. Redlining happens in order to preserve resources for one group 
and deny or extract resources from communities of color and native communities. So redlining in all the major cities in the United States had the best housing in the best neighborhoods reserved for white folks. And native communities and communities of color were historically and currently marginalized and denied access to that. And if we understand that housing systemically connects to education systemically, then we can see what the impacts of redlining are of housing is immediate impacts on education. And then if we understand that education connects to employment, we can see the immediate impacts of education on economic viability. And if we understand that your economic viability often determines where you can afford to live um, in conjunction with dynamics around housing like redlining, then we start to see how this structure in this system of racism works. And if you do that for centuries, um, in the case of redlining over a century, then you've got deeply embedded patterns that cannot be addressed or, or changed by one little tweak here or one adjustment there. On some level, they have to be fundamentally uprooted and we really have to make much deeper, much more substantive change. The last thing I'll say is that there's a, there's a paired system. So as racism is pressing down, like imagine if you will, like a tube, like a clear glass tube, and you've got some water in it that are the resources for life. If you press down, if you apply pressure to one side of the tube, the physics of that tube actually sends more resources to the other side of the tube, right? You press down, seal it up, press down, the water will move in a disproportionate way. So conjoined with the system of racism, as it presses down, it denies and extracts resources from native communities and communities of color. For example, I so appreciate the Congressman's commentary about how COVID is disproportionately affecting the black community, but NPR reported yesterday and Science Friday did a whole episode on native communities and Latinx communities in California and the ways that COVID is in broad ways disproportionately affecting native communities and communities of color. Similarly, if you have a lot of access to resources because of race or because of class, then you have had the opportunity to stay home in Minnesota um, and have groceries delivered and have resources afforded to you without having to take the risks of getting exposed to COVID. So as resources are denied and extracted, they don't go away, just like the water in the tube, it actually lands on the other side. So the last point I'll say is that connected to the system of racism is the system and structure of whiteness, whose constituent parts would be white privilege. And if you're white and listening to this before you get like, don't call me privilege. I get it. I totally get that. But here's the deal. And we're not saying you white person are a horrible white person. Talking about whiteness is again, talking about a system. So I have benefited in my life from redlining and racial bias in education, et cetera, et cetera. I didn't set up those systems, but the ways that they operate, I have been caught in the undertow, caught in the riptide of those systems, and I have benefited from that. So analyzing the system of whiteness is not an attack on white people. Going back to the congressman, congressman's point, it's a diagnosis of what is actually happening, but what's the whole picture here? So as communities of color, native communities are targeted and denied access to resources, major, major life sustaining resources, those resources get shifted and reallocated in different ways, of course, if you're owning class than if you're working class, but shifted and reallocated nonetheless to folks who are red as white, identify as white, experience the United States as white people. And so if we're gonna get the biggest possible picture about what is happening in terms of the system of racial oppression, it's important, critically important to name racism and critically important to name whiteness because I Mr. Floyd was murdered five blocks from my house and I venture to say that if I had gone into Cup Foods and allegedly tried to pass a counterfeit $20 bill, I don't even know if that was true. We don't even know if that actually happened. But if I had allegedly done that, uh, my experience, how I would have been treated and responded to would be dramatically different. It would have been essentially two worlds, living two very different experiences in the United States because I'm white, because I'm white. It doesn't make me a bad person. So again, if you're white and you're like, you're attacking me, we're not, we're diagnosing a system, but we have to have the hard, honest conversation, not just about how racism targets communities of color. We have to have the honest, hard conversation with open hearts, with a deep commitment and passion for a society that we care about, for Dallas, which you care about, have the honest conversation about 
both pieces of this and what's happening and what needs to change, not so that the system gets reversed, but so that we can all benefit, we can all live in safer communities, better educated communities, like everybody wins through the lens of racial justice. It doesn't reverse the situation, it actually ameliorates the situation and moves our society to a dramatically different place that's rooted in equity, it's rooted in love, it's rooted in care, it's rooted in community health and thriving. Um, it's, it's rooted in all the things that allow people to be their best and fullest selves. Everybody, everybody. But we've got a long road to dismantle these systems because both of these components have been in our society for four centuries. So four centuries in, it won't take four centuries out because we're smart, beautiful, capable people, but it will take an extraordinary effort, deep and powerful commitment, and a realigning of a moral compass that says, um, this has to change and let it be, let us be the change. Let us not kick this down the road to the next generation. Let's draw the line here and say, we will do whatever it takes. Thank you, Dr. Hackman. We, we appreciate, um, we appreciate that extraordinary framework. Kimberly, you are uh, coming to us from New York, even though you are, uh, work, your work is here in Dallas. <laughs> Roxanne Gay, in a recent op-ed piece for the New York Times wrote, Racism is litigated over and over again. Mm -hmm. When another video depicting another atrocity comes to light, black people share the truth of their lives and white people treat those truths as intellectual exercises. Mm -hmm. Kimberly, as a former city manager working within systems as an educator, how do you advise people to make the paradigm shift from theory to action? So I, I think one of the one of the things that um, Ms. Gay talked about was, um, you know, when we share our truth, what people really don't realize is every time something like this happens, we're reliving and carrying trauma. Um, and when we talk about health disparities in the Black community, the stress is what starts it all. And so sometimes it's difficult to, to really come from a theoretical perspective when I'm talking to people because the data has been there. When we talk about theory, it's about data, right? It's about the things that we know to be true. Well, we know this to be true, but somehow we don't hold that and move forward with it. So when it comes to action, um, everyone knows me, knows that I'm very blunt and direct, you know, and I hear a lot that this is about getting allies from the white community and from other groups. And I'm honest, we don't need allies, we need defenders. Um, when people kind of classify what we're doing and what's happening now, they're classifying it as a pandemic. But honestly, after 400 years, we're still at war. Um, and we're at war with racism. And so we don't need allies in this fight. We actually need defenders. I don't need someone that says, you know, Kimberly, um, I really support you and I'm standing with you. I need someone to say, Kimberly, I know you were wrong and I'm going to do something about it. And I think that's, that's where action comes from. We have to stop having people that just want to stand, um, stand when it's convenient, stand because it's trendy, um, stand because I can write something and it's great for optics or mar a marketing spin. But this type of challenge and this type of issue that we're dealing with, and we've been dealing with it for over 400 years, requires that people move and do and not simply observe and, and hold in. Um, I always want, um, I feel like when we're talking about um, racism, it almost feels like the black community is responsible for fixing it. Um, and we're responsible for fixing something that we did not do. We're just on the receiving end of it. And so our actions are coming from a place of, we want to be treated equally. We want to be treated equitably. We want to be valued and respected. And quite honestly, recognize for the value and the economic imprint that we've put on this country, because that is true. But that's not always the case, and we're always defending that. And so what I would hope that people would do if we're moving from theory to action, I would hope that people would put out their statements, but put out a statement that has a realistic action. Look at what you're doing inside of your businesses if you're a business owner. Look at what you're doing inside when you're making decisions if you're a leader in any type of company. If you're a student, think about the things that you're thinking, especially my students. I require, when we talk about civil rights, I require that we have a portion where every group that I consider a mobilizing civil rights group, not just the Black community, that every student learn about every group that has impacted some level of significant change for equality and equity in this country. And I had one semester where students just didn't, one class where they just didn't wanna do it. 
And I said, what you're telling me with your actions is that this is not important enough if you are inconvenienced. And in order for us to really push forward, we're going to have to get uncomfortable collectively. We're going to have to be inconvenienced collectively. And then we can really move forward with some action. Um, also with action, I don't think that there's any civil rights movement that has moved the needle significantly in this country that was not sparked or continued by young people. Somehow when it comes to change, we like to hold them back and we don't bring them to the table. And if we're really talking about long time, long term changes, we've got to bring them to the table. They have a different type of energy. They have a different outlook. Um, I say, along with some of my peers, I'm on a second half of life. I probably have more years behind me, realistically, than I have ahead of me. And um, I need to be pouring that knowledge into someone else. But I need for that knowledge to be poured into someone else that's ready and prepared and the doors have been open for them to move and, and train other people and to make some long lasting changes as well. Thank you so much, Kimberly. I'm, I'm gonna turn it to, to somebody who knows a bit about young people as well. <laughs> Dr. Sorrell, uh, a few years ago now, Fortune Magazine named you to its annual World's 50 Greatest Leaders list. Time Magazine named you as one of 31 people changing the South. Higher education is an entrenched system. You have turned that system upside down with what you have done at Paul Quinn College here in Dallas. There are many examples of pilots that actually work to turn around some unjust systems in all kinds of fields. What we often lack though is the will to actually scale them. New young leaders are emerging right now in this anti-racism fight. What advice do you have for them as Kimberly was talking about, to be effective in creating the change that is needed. What do you wish all well-meaning white people and white philanthropy will learn from your success? And you have just a few minutes to answer those very broad questions, Dr. Sorrell. And I've been in the audience many times when you've spoken, so I know you can do it. Well, so I would say a, a couple of things. Um, first of all, we cannot pretend that people haven't known what they should do all along, right? None of this is a revelation, okay? I mean, I, I, for the life of me, have been trying to understand what was so different about Brother Floyd than Eric Garner, okay? Because we watched the same thing. I watched Eric Garner die. I listened to Eric Garner plead for his life. I saw it on YouTube. I watched the officers responsible for it be basically allowed to get off scot-free. Now I am thrilled that this moment occurs, but I just, you know, I'm not here to pretend that people don't know what the problem is. And so I say that at the outset of my comments to what I would share with young leaders, the same thing that I share with my students and have been sharing with them for 13 years, right? Talk is cheap, okay? There are gonna be lots of people who try and talk you out of action. You have to be committed to sustained action. You have to understand that it is going to mean that you will be wooed by the siren song of the status quo, right? Individuals that will invite you to their tea parties, you will become the cause du jour, you will be popular in all the places that you are trying to transform. And, and you have to be honest with yourself. Are you here for their song or are you here for the change? And if you are here for the change, it means you have to continue to speak the unvarnished truth, no matter how uncomfortable it makes people. Find yourself a place where your style, your fit, your narrative, your language, your values fit, and then fight from that location. And understand that you will always be wooed by others. There will always be individuals who want to co-opt you and your abilities and your passion and your beliefs for their causes or their version of your cause. You don't do it, right? Be, find your truth, be honest with your truth. But I also want to say something else that I, I don't think people talk about. It is hard to wage war when you can't finance your own war, right? I mean, 
some of my favorite rappers have always said, you don't go to war until your money is right. Okay? So the idea that you can transform everything without having the resources to transform anything just continues the cycle. When you are begging your adversaries for your resources, you have already lost. He, who fund, he or she who funds your dream controls your dream. That is what I need them to understand. So to affect change in a sustained way, it has to be on multiple levels. You have to have the financial resources. You have to have the intellectual capital. You have to have the numbers. And you have to understand the public policy aspect of this. And you have to understand that when you have a revolution in June, it's not over in August. So you must continue to fight in an ongoing, sustained way. So I am thrilled to see it, but I just know we have to be here for the long haul. And I'm here to educate and prepare people for the long haul. You do that extraordinarily well, and we are grateful to you for, for all of the many ways that you do offer that education. Dr. Hackman, th this notion of, you know, this rhetoric that we hear about how we don't see color and those kinds of uh, comments that folks often make when we know that that is simply not true. There is enough data, psychological data about the unconscious and to tell us that that simply is not true. Talk to us a little bit about an understanding and help us with the understanding of unconscious bias and how it affects uh, each of us in the work that we, we want to do in this area. Um, yeah, I think that um, as, as folks on this panel have said, uh, all of us have said, that this, is, this system is much bigger than um, any individual. And so to pretend that I'm not being affected by the messages that are currently and historically in our society um, is simply not true, is simply not true. And so um, certainly the depictions of, uh, for me when I was growing up of native people and people of color um, were always problematic, always uh, negative in terms of racial narratives. The depiction of white people was always positive, always, always, always. And so I've been heavily, heavily socialized throughout the course of my lifetime um, to subscribe to the deeply held narratives. And again, critical race theory doesn't call them stereotypes because that's way too superficial of a term. They're much more deep. They're deeply held racial narratives that the society um, constructs its engagement with the, the system of racism around in, in really profound ways. And so the notion that it's merely uh, unconscious bias, it actually is a, a little too superficial. These are deeply, deeply socialized, deeply ingrained ideas that everybody has to pay critical attention to. Even communities of color um, have been, have received misinformation about native communities or other communities of color. And so we've all got some work to do to extricate the misinformation that the system propagates. And why, why does it propagate that? Because you have a system of racism and whiteness operating in a society that proclaims to be a democracy. So how, what provides cover for that profoundly inequitable system? What provides cover for it is the story of race, the story of race. And so um, the, uh, uh, black folks are like this and white people are like that. The, the stereotypes, the unconscious bias, implicit bias, but actually is much more deeply held narratives. And so what's critical for white folks to kind of respond in line with some of the comments about action is not to take this um, uh, personally as an attack, not to simply say, oh, it's my own unconscious bias, but to pay attention to what's gone on historically um, and currently and take, as, as everyone has said, very direct, very concrete action. So what we try to do to support white people moving through that are four steps, wake up, catch up, show up and clean up. And so wake up to the realities of systems and history in this country. Um, Michael Eric Dyson says, it, you know it intuitively, something's not right. Um, Beverly Daniel Tatum used to teach the psychology of race, used to ask students across the racial spectrum, um, uh, uh, if you could, um, uh, come back as a person of color, a white person, who would you come back as? And everybody in the class, regardless of race, said white, because it's a dominant racial structure. Most students of color said, but just for a day, you know, not, not permanently, but just for a day, just for a day, because the dominant structure 
um, everyone understands intuitively how this society works and the mechanisms of this society along lines of race. And so what we need to do is wake up to the reality, stop pretending that we don't know. And, and there might be some folks who really don't know. That means we have to get educated on how systems and history work. The catch up is to get very clear about current policies and the ways that racism is operating in those policies, whether it's policing, education, healthcare, how is healthcare operating in terms of racial bias? And there's ample information. Harriet Washington wrote the book, Medical Apartheid, critically important piece to understand racism in the healthcare system, then and now. So the catch up, is to really understand the current manifestations of racism in concrete ways, in public policy ways, in ways that land on the bodies and in the communities of Native people, people of color. The show up is not to then, and this goes to your point earlier about philanthropy, is not then for me as a well-resourced white person to say, oh, I have the idea and go do my own thing. The show up is to look for which communities of color, Native communities are taking strong, powerful leadership around this, have for decades, and how do I align my efforts and energies with those policy initiatives, with those actions, with those sentiments, in terms of creating real and lasting change around racial justice. And then the cleanup is really what was alluded to earlier, is a real substantial redistribution of resources, not in a way that reverses the system, but in a way that creates access that is profoundly equitable and really actually meets this kind of story that we tell about ourselves as a country, really meets the aspirations of a democracy, of people having equitable access no matter who they are. So wake up to what has happened, catch up to what's happening right now, show up in support of leadership with communities of color and native communities and advancing racial justice policy initiatives, racial justice agendas, um, and then clean up and have the hard conversation about resources and how do we really shift resources in healthcare in a way that accounts for this disproportionate reality around COVID and any other issue that's a life-sustaining system or resource in our society. So there's work to be done. Book groups are good. I'm not dissing on that. You really need to pay attention to what's happening and learn, but this is a moment of action as well. And we all need to move. We all need to move. Appreciate that. Those, those steps are, are uh, excellent. And I want to um, go to Kimberly on this because the, the power of funding, as Michael Sorrell says, is critical. Um, the understanding the narrative of racism is critical but most philanthropy is uh, run by white people. And um, Kimberly, you have spoken a bit about the role of philanthropy and the adjustments that need to be made there. Do you want to uh, make some further comments about that for our audience today? Absolutely. So um, one thing this entire season, so the, the COVID-19 pandemic going right into what we're seeing now with the protests around the country has sparked something in me that's been very disturbing. I think it's always been there, but it's, been, it's just in your face at this point. And it's um, how funders, um, whether it's, you know, a private foundation, a larger foundation, you know, some sort of larger foundation, um, any type of group that convenes foundations and brings them together, and then the nonprofits themselves, how the Black community is, has been and is being used um, for our trauma. Um, and there's this level of saviorism to come in and save the Black community. But the one thing that I did not see and I have not seen are people authentically serving in accordance with their missions. Um, and the organizations that have been on boots on the ground serving because they're part of the community, they're typically Black-led, are not being funded. Um, when George Floyd, because I, George Floyd is just the gasoline. That was just the incident that was the gasoline because the fire has been going for a long time. But we went Amy Cooper and then we went to, um, we had Ahmaud Aubrey, Amy Cooper, and then George Floyd, all of that back to back. And so to see that the philanthropic and nonprofit sector, um, they were very, everybody was very quiet about what was happening. It was disturbing to me. Um, because what it says to me, and it can be interpreted that way from the people that are intended as being the recipients of the, of the, ser the services and the programs, is that my trauma is good enough for you to sell and tell, but my livelihood and my safety is not. 
And it is important that when you use black, the black community, any marginalized group, if they are part of your base, so the nonprofit organizations, the funders that have the priorities to fund those particular nonprofit organizations, and then the organizations that serve as the umbrella for, for the funders, everyone at the end of the day touches the black community. And if we don't see statements with action coming out condemning it, it really says that you're not here for the right reasons. It comes across that this is more about assimilation than it is about corrective action um, when it comes to what should be right and equal and fair, um, fair for all of us. Um, I would really like to see from me, this is not coming from anyone else, I would really like to see that the funders and the philanthropists begin looking at the small and mid-sized nonprofit organizations that are founded and led by Black women and men in our communities that have been around for a while, how doing has stayed relevant during COVID-19 with little to no resources and have been doing more than organizations with six-figure budgets, seven-figure budgets, and higher. Um, and it's, it's, it's telling because it means that the one group of people in the social sector that we should be able to rely on for change have abandoned us in some way because it doesn't fit the narrative, the marketing narrative, and that has got to change. Who is going to help us if the group of people who said that this is about mankind and ensuring that humanity is at its best will not say anything? We can't expect the government to do it. We can't expect corporations to do it. If those that are saying that my purpose and my reason for being here is to do better and to make sure everybody is at their best, won't say anything at all. Thank you, Kimberly, for those words. And perhaps we will create a strategy around those at the board level at Social Venture Partners. And we are grateful to you for your service to us and to the whole philanthropic community. Thank you. Dr. Sorrell, our friend Miguel Solis wrote an odd ed piece for the Dallas Morning News where he said a path to reconciliation exists and it is rooted in a comprehensive policy of recognition and reparation. How necessary do you think reparations are to healing the rightful rage that is felt by the black community and who will be the voice that organizes that and leads that, would you say? So, um, Reparations is an interesting topic. I actually taught a course on reparations this past semester at the college. And the challenge was design a program for reparations that was capable of garnering political support in this era that will not cost your advocates their political seats, right? So that, that was the challenge. It's an acknowledgement that for every step forward that we have seen historically, the backlash has been tremendous. We are living in the backlash of Barack Obama, right? Donald Trump is the backlash for President Barack Obama, right? No matter what anyone else wants to say, no matter how they want to characterize it, like we know that's the truth. Um, so when we, when we talk about reparations, I think it's important to understand that reparations can be almost any, can take almost any form, right? I mean, Let's start with housing policy, creating equitable housing policies that overcome the racist practices that have been employed for years. I mean, you know, the color of law, which you referred to, Heather. Like, I mean, just there, there's all, once you fully understand that we got the country that we designed, then all of these things start to, start to unravel in a sense. So, I mean, reparations would be amazing if when, you, when, when they were distributed, the rules weren't rewritten to eviscerate whatever reparations you were given. So, I mean, the first thing is, how about just the establishment of fair, equitable, and sustainable policies? Okay, I mean, listen, you really want to do reparations? Stop the appointment of unqualified Uber conservative judges to the courts, right? I'm not saying that people can't have a different political view. I'm saying be qualified, right? I mean, these are, you don't have to recreate the wheel to affect change, 
we just have to do the little things that make sense. So if it were me, if, if I were going to address these issues in a systemic and sustainable way, number one, I would address redistricting, right? The gerrymandering of districts has made it virtually impossible to have equal quality representation. So that's number one. Number two, I would transform the housing policies so that people have an opportunity for home ownership in communities that the homes hold value. Because we know that the single greatest way to build wealth in this country is through home ownership, right? But again, if when you are buying your home, the rules that apply to you are different than the rules that apply to everyone else, then you didn't get what you bargained for, All right? So, so I think we have to address those issues, number three, we've got to speak to the disparities in school funding, all right? We recruit students from all over the country. I don't need anyone to tell me what goes on in the public schools of this country because I go into the public schools of this country. I know that the student who is being educated in a under-resourced community in the inner cities of Detroit, Chicago, Washington, New York, Dallas, Houston, LA, Oakland, is not getting the same value, the same resources, the same education as that student that goes to school in Plano, that goes to school in uh, northern suburbs of Chicago, going to school in the Virginia suburbs. I get, so we have to address those issues. So if you wanna talk about reparations, how about we just make sure the laws that we employ are fairly enacted on everyone that we can start there then we can work on the other forms of reparation i appreciate that so much michael in if you would and we just have a very few minutes left um, and maybe just a just a brief minute and one sentence uh, reflect on how these last three months have changed you oh uh, they haven't changed me uh, are we talking about COVID? COVID and what's happened over the last couple of weeks and what, what has it changed you at all? Yeah, none of this has changed me at all, right? If anything, um, it has emboldened me in a sense and not the George Floyd piece because, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the, the George piece, I, because I already knew that, right? Like that, that's my reality, okay? I have been profiled. I have been harassed. I have been, you know, accosted by the police and put in handcuffs, right? Like, I know that experience, right? I know it was for doing nothing, absolutely nothing. I've had the officer put his hand on his gun when he's trying to explain to me exactly what I did to merit being pulled over, right? And by the way, that wasn't 15, 20, 25 years ago, okay? So I, I know, all right, so that, 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 that didn't change me. What, what has changed me is recognizing how incapable we are of a society of sustained sacrifice to affect permanent change. And that comes from COVID-19 because we have adopted practices as if this thing has gone away. And it's actually worse today than when we sheltered in place. Mm -hmm. But we don't have the discipline, we don't have the capacity for the sacrifice that is necessary. And I submit to you, it's because too many people don't know people who have suffered under this disease. Because if you did, if you watched your people be crippled by this, and by the way, this isn't the flu, this isn't a week or two, you're down. I don't know anyone that has had it, been afflicted with it, and didn't suffer painfully for a month or more. All right, like, so, so that, what that has taught me is yet again, the tyranny of the majority and the status quo has to be battled because they're wrong. My peers in higher education that think it's okay to send people back to school in the fall in person because they can control this. What institutions are they watching? because I don't know what behavior of students that their customers say. And I'm gonna allow for the fact that maybe they just have the ability to regulate behavior in a way that I don't, right? But if anything, what this has taught me is that those of us that recognize madness 
have to speak up against madness aggressively, often, and continuously. Thank I'm not sure friend. I wasn't doing that anyway. So, you know, that's... Your, your leadership is astounding, and we are grateful for it, and we're grateful that it's here in our community in, in this area. Thank you. Kimberly, we just have a few seconds. How has this changed, yeah. or has it? No, it has. Um, it, it has, because those who are close to me know that, to the present point, that I was in isolation. I am one that recovered from COVID-19. Um, and I'll never be the same. I will never be the same. I think what it has done for me is re-energize me to go harder um, and to be more vocal because I know what it feels like to think that you're not going to make it the very next day. And so um, the issues that we're, we're facing now between the pandemic and, and the war on racism, those are things that have to be addressed. And um, I think that we have to find a way um, and I'm going to find a way to remain committed um, to see to see that change. So for me, it's about policy. It's about getting people in and out of office. It's about showing our economic blueprint um, when it comes to the country. And more and most importantly, sharing the history of this country. We've got to stop talking about it. Just because it's not here legally anymore doesn't mean that we don't need to address it and talk about it. Because um, we're not going to move forward if we don't understand where we've come from. Thank you, Kimberly. Dr. Hackman. Um, I absolutely appreciate everything that Michael and Kimberly have said, not just in those two reflections, but this entire time. So thank you for your wisdom and your experience. Um, and for me, ditto to those concepts of kind of the larger social dynamics uh, in COVID. The one thing that stands out in addition to that is um, how toxic an I mentality is, and, and that the only way we're going to make it is if we move from the I to the we. That is the only way that we will survive if we live in community, work in community, if I see my neighbor's healthcare and well being as important as my own, um, if I start to think about the greater good rather than I want to go to the beach, I want to go to the party, I want to go to the restaurant, so I don't care what you think. Um, that idea has always been toxic, but it is literally going to kill people now. It will literally kill people now. So this notion of individuality and rugged individualism and I, me, me, enough about me, what do you think about me? That kind of standard jam in mainstream US society, it has to fundamentally shift to a collective we. And many marginalized communities around race or class already know that, already know that the way to survive is interdependence. Um, it's those that have excessive amounts of resources or even moderate amounts of resources that do not understand that the, the ethos of I is actually a very toxic social notion, but we're seeing that it's actually quite toxic in terms of COVID. And so we have to shift to a we. And I think that this particular period of three months hopefully has helped some, some people in this country understand that. Thank you, Heather. I started off this uh, panel by telling the audience how much and how grateful I am to each of you for all the learnings that you have provided for me over these many years. And I know that you have done the same once again for me and for our audience. So I thank you very much for your willingness to join this conversation. You know, George Floyd has been brought home to Texas. His funeral is being televised here and has started at 11 o'clock. We are two minutes behind that, but we want to acknowledge his death, acknowledge what that symbolizes, but most importantly, understand that now there is a family that is saying goodbye to their loved one. And so we want to acknowledge that, acknowledge how not only communal these losses are, but how personal they are for many people. At the end of the day, we have nothing but our humanity to share, which encompasses a couple of virtues that we share in common, that virtue to seek after justice, and the virtue of fortitude. It's going to take an awful lot of strength to continue this work. But as many of our panelists said, when we are doing this work together, we can actually accomplish it. So as we end our session, I would like you to take just a few moments of silence as the funeral in Houston begins. And I am grateful to you for the work that you do for our entire community. Thank you.